I think it was around 1975 when the music and youth minister at my church announced that a southern gospel group was coming for a concert the next Sunday night following the evening worship service. Interestingly, for some reason, the concert would not take place in the church sanctuary, but instead across the street at the Civic Center that the city of Gardendale had built in 1970. The name of the so-called Southern Gospel Group was the Pat Terry Group, whom I had never heard of, and I certainly was not interested in going to hear a Southern Gospel concert. On the night of the event, I was sitting on the back row pew in the worship service. As we were singing the first hymn, I noticed that three young men, who looked to be in their early 20s, came in and sat down in one of the pews a few rows ahead of me. Two of them had long hair, and it appeared that the third one would have had long hair as well, if not for the fact that his head was in the initial stages of balding. One of the young men had blonde hair and wore glasses, so his appearance reminded me of the folk singer-songwriter John Denver. I remember thinking to myself, who are these guys? They certainly did not look like any Southern Gospel group that I had ever seen. Not only that, but every Southern Gospel group that I knew about had at least four and sometimes five members. I eventually concluded that these three guys had to be the Pat Terry group. Who else could they be? Based on their long hair and appearance, I decided to go to the concert, even though it had been advertised as Southern Gospel. When I went into the Civic Center, the first thing I noticed was two acoustic guitars and a bass guitar set up on stage, which caused me to deduce that the Pat Terry group would not be performing Southern Gospel music. And by the first few measures of the first song, I realized my presumption was correct because they didn't sound anything like a Southern Gospel group. In fact, their music reminded me of my favorite group, America, and I was pleasantly surprised. I loved their music so much that I began buying their albums and listening to them often. I went to see them a few more times over the following years, including a concert at Samford University where I would later attend. The Pat Terry Group recorded several albums in the 70s, including one that was simply titled The Pat Terry Group, and then others, such as Songs of the South, Sweet Music, and Heaven Ain't All There Is, before Pat Terry released a few solo albums in the early 80s that were more reflective and indicative of a deepening and maturing faith with an emphasis on social responsibility. I remember one of my theologically conservative friends buying one of these later albums, and I asked him what he thought about it, and he said, Oh, it's not like his early albums at all. In fact, I don't even like it, because it's nothing but social gospel songs. According to Tom Granger in an article on the website allmusic.com, Pat Terry was one of the few in early Jesus music worth his salt as a songwriter. The Pat Terry group produced a handful of interesting pop contemporary Christian music albums in the mid to late 70s but couldn't prepare fans for the trio of artful, introspective solo records made in the early 80s with Mark Hurd that were to be his last in the gospel market. Falling in the category of whatever happened to, Pat Terry would go on to become a successful Nashville songwriter, an artist like Travis Tritt, Alan Jackson, Tanya Tucker, the Oak Ridge Boys, Confederate Railroad, and Kenny Chesney have all recorded his songs. 
As I reflect on my memories of seeing the Pat Terry group for the first time and how my music and youth minister had labeled their music as Southern Gospel, it caused me to think about how we put labels on people. In fact, as you will hear me talk about in a future reflection, I don't like the idea of labeling people, although sometimes it might be necessary to do so, as in the example of music. Though some would argue that you shouldn't even put labels on music, why not just call it music? And that is a valid question. If you are trying to confine musical artists or stifle their creativity, for example, like expecting a country artist to never include any pop sounding elements in their recordings, as Sylvia, Shania Twain, and others have done. Even so, labels in music can be helpful when describing the type of music an artist performs. After all, as in the case of my Pat Terry story, I am quite sure that some of the older folks who went to the concert expecting a night of Southern Gospel music were highly disappointed. I, on the other hand, was delighted to discover that their music was not Southern Gospel at all. What is the point of this reflection? Well, it's simply an homage to Pat Terry and how his music inspired and challenged me spiritually in the days of my youth. And secondly, generally speaking, I don't think we should put labels on people at all. But if you are going to label people, or if it is helpful and necessary to do so at times, then by all means, at least label them correctly. Thanks for listening, my friend. Don't know how to say you. I guess that